And I want to welcome everybody to um, what I think is a very special day, very special event. For me as a surgeon, I tend to get focused in on very concrete issues, you know, going to the operating room, taking the tumor out, doing it safely. But it occurred to me, and it happened a couple years ago, one of, one of my patients came to me and he said, you know, you, you took great care of, of my wife, you did everything right, but you took lousy care of me. I said, what do you mean? You didn't have the tumor. He said, I know, but I was the caregiver. And I was like, wow, I've never heard that word before, caregiver. And then I started to think about it. And yeah, I realized that we have been remiss as physicians in our responsibility in caregiving. So um, he challenged me. He challenged myself and Suzanne Chang, one of our neuro-oncologists. And to make a long story short, we made a training video. We got a, a grant from a private foundation and made a training video on how to be good caregivers. And I sent it to every neuro-oncologist and every neurosurgeon in the country for gratis because I, I really believe that that is tantamount to patient safety is our ability to really care for or provide the necessary, necessary tools for those who do give care. So to be here today to talk about not only our research program, <clears throat> but also on how we think the caregiver's role has evolved is very special. And so I had this very unique opportunity uh, to go back to Boston at the request of Vicki Kennedy and Senator Kennedy, I was very honored to meet with them in Boston and discuss his case and help him decide and, and Vicki on how to proceed, how to start down this very long, difficult pathway. And it was a very, I can say, it was a very humbling experience for me to meet someone like the Senator and Vicki. Vicki, in her own right, has been a tremendous advocate for women's issues um, and for a, a number of things as an, as an accomplished attorney. And to meet with both of them at their greatest time of need, I think, was very, very special for me. I'll, I'll never forget that opportunity. And again, Vicki, I thank you for allowing me to help during that time. Um, and you know, as the story unfolded, over the course of a year, I learned a lot about Vicki Kennedy and Senator Kennedy. What I learned was that they didn't stop living. So as a physician, you know, we all came to the conclusion we had to have health care reform. Had to. Well, who was behind it? It was Vicki and Senator Kennedy. This was their lifelong passion and dream. And yet, all during this process, I mean, radiation, chemotherapy, rehab, you never knew what was going on because he was out there and Vicki was there battling for health care reform and all the things that meant so much to them. So the take-home message is if your loved one has a brain tumor and you're the caregiver, you must do everything possible to go back to normalcy as much as you can. You know, I tell patients when they come in to see me for clinic, I say, you know, it's like a report card. You come in, we sit down and we talk, and then you forget you were here. Go out and live your life and forget about it and do the best you can with it. So I hope we're going to cover a number of those issues today. And um, again, I really want to welcome Vicki for taking the time to come here Joining Vicki on the podium, <clears throat> I just want to mention three special guests. Uh, Jennifer Clark, she's one of our neuro-oncologists who joined us. Uh, Jenny was uh, a neurology resident here at UCSF, outstanding, and then went to Memorial Sloan Kettering for a neuro-oncology fellowship. She's with us. Margareta Page, who's one of our spectacular nurses, who helps us with our clinical trials and uh, she's just marvelous. I, I tell you, if I ever got ill, she would be the one to take care of me. She's very, very special. 
And then Stacy Sullivan. And Stacy's going to tell you her story, but I'm just going to give you um, a short bit of it because it's so much a part of my life. She's, I consider her my daughter because at the age of eight, um, when I was at the University of Washington, I operated on her for a brain tumor. And um, she was petrified, of course. And her father, Chuck, is here, who I've gotten to know, Chuck, and, and, and the family very well. And um, what happened was, I hope you don't mind me telling this, Stacy, but, you know, sometimes when you go through part of the scalp, the muscle atrophy. So she had a divot here. And she came back to clinic one day, and she was depressed. I said, what? What's wrong? And we got into this issue. The kids were taunting me. And oh, she was losing self-confidence. So I said, okay, I got a great idea. So I didn't tell her. So I thought about it. And I went to, I lived up in Seattle at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I went to a beauty salon. Jean Juarez Beauty Salon. That was the name of it. And for $80 out of my pocket, I bought this kid a day of beauty. And when I went into the beauty salon, I said, okay, here's the deal. I want you to restore her confidence. I want you to show her how to put her hair over that area so that she's not bothered by that. They did it. She turned into a different person. I got the pictures to prove it. We keep a little album in my office and, you know, I just love it. And then one day as an adolescent, she called me and said, she said, oh, Dr. Berger, I'm, I want to give back. I'm going to become a nurse or a doctor, and um, I'm going to come work for you. And I said, oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I'd love it. I'd love it. But, you know, okay. <laughs> well, guess what? <laughs> she went off to Hawaii Pacific, I think, got her nursing degree, called me and said, you got that job for me? And I went to the head of nursing. I said, you're going to hire this person. <laughs> and she works with me on the ward. She sees my patients. She puts her arm around my patients. I just love her to death. I just love her. So without getting all choked up about that, um, we are here today again to welcome Vicki and to talk about caregiving and research and the whole process of being involved with this problem and what we're doing to fix it here at UCSF. And thanks very much for coming and being so supportive. So without further ado, Vicki, if you could join us at the panel and the rest of the panel. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mitch, for that warm introduction. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for the unbelievable advice you gave to Teddy and me when we had our diagnosis. You know, when we, were, when we got that diagnosis, we looked for the best minds, the best medical minds in the world. You are so lucky here to have Mitch Berger because he was at the top of our list. And we got into an East Coast, West Coast kind of thing, and where do you travel and how do you do, seriously. But Mitch stayed in touch with us. His advice was indispensable to us. He was part of our team. And he and I have stayed in touch during that time. And when he talked to me about what you all are doing here and asked me to come out here and talk to you, I was honored to be here. And I am so thrilled to be here and talk to you about our journey. And Sue, it's so great to be here with you, your magnificent chancellor. You are so blessed to have such a dynamic woman at the helm. I just love women in power. I just absolutely love it. And Jan, speaking of women in power, there you are. So it's great to be here with all of you. You know, we all come to this from a different place. Some in this room are researchers. Some are donors and advocates. Some are the doctors and nurses who treat patients. Some, as we saw, are patients themselves. And some, like me, are family members, caregivers. But however we come to the issue of brain tumors, we are all, we must all be in this together. 
And that's why I wanted to be here today. From the day my husband was diagnosed with his brain tumor, it wasn't just his brain tumor. It was our brain tumor. And that's always how I described it. It was our brain tumor in every single way. It was a joint journey. And that's the story I want to tell you this morning, the story of our brain tumor. And I hope you agree with me that it is not a sad story. It's a story of hope and happiness, of love and laughter and outstanding medicine and optimism. But first I want to say I know how blessed we were. I know that we had health insurance. We had financial resources. We had financial job security. We had access to the best medical minds, including Mitch Berger, to help us. We had family around us, and maybe most of all, we had each other. You know, we used to say all the time, thank God we love each other, but even more, thank God we like each other. <laughs> because we spent so much time together and wanted to spend that time together. I never take all of those advantages for granted. But it's no exaggeration when I say that spending those 15 months with my husband, those last 15 months of his life, that was the greatest gift of my life. It was the greatest privilege of my life. Now, don't get me wrong. No one wishes for a diagnosis of a glioblastoma. But once I knew that was the hand we were dealt, I would have chosen to live life exactly in every single way, the way we lived it. And so that's the journey I want to tell you about. That journey started on a beautiful morning in May, mid-May, 2008. Now, you may know that my husband was a sailor. His life revolved around sailing his boat, and it was the first morning, it was the first day that the boat was in the water for that season, and everything was geared toward taking a sail that day. We woke up in the morning, we had our coffee, we read the newspapers, we talked about some family matters, and he got up from the table just before we were ready to eat breakfast and said he was going to take the dogs out for a walk. Well, he never made it outside to take the dogs for a walk. It was that quick. And he had what I later came to know was a generalized seizure, what we used to call a grand mal seizure. But I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what was happening. I just knew it was something very serious, something grave. After calls to 911, the arrival of the EMTs, the taking him to the local hospital, the medevacking him to Boston, all of the tests, it was an absolute roller coaster. And I went from concern to fear to terror to uncertainty. I mean, I thought he was having a stroke. At one time, I thought he was losing his life to then thinking he was going to be okay, then to not knowing what was happening. And the doctors seemed uncertain. And then we started to say, well, it was a seizure, but maybe it was gone, and we didn't know what was causing it. And then finally, they started to say, we think he has a brain tumor. And by the end of that day, it was like, you know what? Prove it to me. Okay, enough already. I've had a terrible day. <laughs> Just prove it to me. And I wasn't in denial, but I wasn't in acceptance either. I just wanted them to show us. And they did. I was so focused on him and his well-being, and honestly, I was so happy that he seemed okay that a lot of the news didn't quite sink in. And we had something that other people don't have to worry about. We had to worry about the public. The press was camped out at the hospital, 
and people loved him. He, he was their family as much as he was our family. And I needed to let them know that their family member was okay. And so I'm hoping my audio visuals are going to work. This was the day of Teddy's diagnosis. We had a photo. Our whole family came together and just to show the world that he was okay. And I think that said a lot about how he was going to handle the diagnosis, how we were going to deal with our brain tumor. We were going to enjoy our family. We were going to enjoy our life and show the public that being diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor doesn't mean the end of joy and hope and good times. Teddy felt so strongly that he had an obligation to do everything he could to be a role model for people who were facing a terrible diagnosis. He thought that maybe his treatment could advance cancer research. Or maybe his positive approach to life could help someone else live just one happier day. And his positive approach, without a question, was it set the tone and it inspired me. But I also think he came to it with a little different perspective from other people. As he said to me, getting his diagnosis was nothing compared to hearing that two of his children had cancer. He had a son diagnosed with cancer when he was 12 years old, and he lost his leg to cancer. And he had a daughter diagnosed with cancer when she was 42, and it's severe cancer. And his perspective was that it was so much worse when it's your child and that he could take it and he was going to be a role model for others. And that was the attitude that he projected. But let me say this. He wasn't putting on a happy face. It, he understood himself and what he needed to do to stay ahead of the darkness, as he put it. He needed to live life. That was the decision he made. He needed to embrace life. He needed to breathe fresh air. He still needed to be that strong person that everyone in our family relied on. He needed to be those big shoulders that we leaned on. And he needed to sail his boat. He believed that sailing wasn't only a metaphor for life. It was an affirmation of life. And so when we left the hospital in Boston after the diagnosis, the first thing we did was head out, it was cold, was head out, return home to Hyannisport, and go out for a sail. He embraced life. There he is, skippering that big old boat, breathing fresh air, captaining his own ship, steering his own course. We still didn't know what his treatment plan was going to be. We didn't know what the future would hold, but every single day he was out there on that boat. Once his treatment plan had been decided, of course, it was, we were fast on, that, fast on that track. And we weren't, let me just say this, we were optimists throughout, but not Pollyannas. We understood the seriousness of what the diagnosis was. Teddy always said, and I think as a caregiver, this was my most important thing. He always said I was great in a crisis, and he relied on me to be great in a crisis. So I saved my tears for those private times, usually in the shower by myself, you know, because he needed me to be strong. He needed me to be his advocate, and I took that role willingly. He needed to still be the nice guy <laughs> because that was his persona. So I was sort of the, the um, he could be the happy lion and I was the fierce lioness. Um, but he showed me that you could live life in three time zones, so to speak. And I think this is a great lesson for everyone facing this challenge. And it was the way we got through it. The first time zone was to be really, really practical, and he got all of his business in order. It was very, very practical, and I mean spiritually, legally, legislatively, with the family. He did all to care business. 
did all that in a very matter-of-fact and important way. He teed up all the legislation he was working on. He met with the lawyer. He met with the priest. I mean, he did everything that he needed to do. But at the same time, we lived in the present time zone. And we had an unspoken pact between us that we would not grieve until there was time to grieve, that we weren't going to ruin the time we had, which we hoped was going to be a very long time, that we weren't going to ruin it by talking about what-ifs, that we were going to do exactly what Mitch Berger talked about, that we were going to live life. We weren't going to spend our time dying. We were going to spend our time living, and we did that, and it was magnificent. And finally, we lived in a goal-oriented time zone. Teddy was a person who needed a goal. He needed to have something to look forward to. His number one goal was being able to speak at the Democratic Convention. So we were looking forward to August of 2008 and being able to speak in the Democra- at the Democratic Convention. But something came up before that that was exhilarating beyond exhilarating. We were driving from Cape Cod to Boston one morning, and he's reading the newspaper, reading the Boston Globe, and he said, Medicare, Medicare is is in jeopardy, and the vote failed, a filibuster failed to be broken by one vote. I would have been the one vote. I need to get back to Washington. Now, he had had a craniotomy at that point three weeks before. I said, no, 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 Teddy, you can't go back to Washington. You just had brain surgery. No, you, and he, so he calls his office, and he starts this thing about, I've got to get back to Washington. And they said, no, Senator, it was a political vote. They would never have let it be that close if you were there. Don't worry about it. And ever the politician, he said, aha, but now they're down in ink. <laughs> They've got 59 votes. They needed 60 votes for this procedural vote. They can't take back those 59 votes. And if I show up... I'll break the filibuster if they call the vote again. And he had this in his mind, and they did call the vote again. And it was a secret little background thing that no one knew about except the majority leader and Teddy, who was absolutely determined. So this is four and a half weeks after brain surgery. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Total surprise to his colleagues. And this is the longest clip that I have to show you. I was in the gallery watching, weeping. Both sides of the aisle stood up cheering for him. Total violation of protocol and decorum in the Senate. he'd forgotten he was there to vote. <laughs> and somebody nudged him and said, you've got to vote. The time is clicking down. You know, they had 15 minutes of the vote. After he voted, not only did they get the 60 votes, But all so many votes on the other side of the aisle shifted so that they ended up with 70-something votes, which made it veto-proof. It was just the whole power of his presence and his being there that just pushed everything over the... it It was so... it was such a shot in the arm for him. It was such a shot in the arm. The next thing he was geared toward was speaking at the Democratic Convention. This was in July of 2008. This was July 9th. The Democratic Convention was August 25th, 2008. And he started working on the speech. Um, We started working on it at the very, probably the very end of July, beginning of August, drafting it, working with the speechwriter, Teddy and I and the speechwriter, drafting it together and having a teleprompter and practicing it and just trying to see how would the teleprompter work. And we realized that having it in front and not side to side was the way to go. Um, And... 
editing it and working it and seeing how, what, how it would, it was an unbelievable experience. Every day at 10 o'clock, we had a secret little place set up in the house where we would practice the teleprompter. And he was like, again, he loved these little secret things that he was going to spring speaking at the democratic convention on the democratic convention. And the day we left, he started to feel some pain in his side. And we thought the dog had jumped on him and given him a bruise Little did we know that he was having the first kidney stone of his life. And we got to Denver, and here he is, fine in every way, ready for his speech, and he had a kidney stone. It was unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. So the day of his speech, he spent the entire day in the hospital giving him medication for pain, flooding him with fluids, trying to get him, forgive me for being graphic, trying to get him to pass a kidney stone, which he did not before the speech. And this man said, I did not come to Denver to not give a speech. I, I said, well, you can just stand there and wave. And he said, I am not going to just wave. I'm going to give my speech. So we cut the speech in half. He had never seen the version that was cut in half, much to everybody's, and had never walked into the auditorium. But here he goes, and I'm not going to show him give the speech. I'll just show you some photos. But here I am kissing him, thinking, oh, my God, please be able to do this. Uh, I had not slept a wink because I'd been up all night with Mr. Kidney Stone. And, uh, but there he is. It was such an exhilarating, such, he was so, look at that face, just of joy and happiness. He did not want to leave the stage. He was so happy when it was over. And we... Uh, afterwards, we were supposed to go right back to the hospital, and he wouldn't leave. And we were with three doctors who all who happened to be named Larry, 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 and Larry. Don't even, I mean, it's like a bad movie. And so Larry, Larry, and Larry were saying, Senator, you've got to get back to the hospital. He goes, why? Let's watch TV. They liked my speech. You know, he was so excited. And we finally, he was on adrenaline. I mean, the adrenaline is the most, clearly the most powerful drug that there is. I mean, he was so excited. And we dragged him back to the hospital, and he finally, you know, we had, you know, bingo later that night. And the next morning, he met, he had, we had a breakfast, and he was with his colleagues, and he was just on top of the world. It was such a, such a shot in the arm. He then was geared toward being able to return to the Senate. He wanted to return to the Senate. When he was first diagnosed, he had an unfortunate physician who told him that he would never go back to the Senate and that he should just basically love his wife. He writes about this in his book, um, love his wife, be with his children, and it basically, it's sayonara, baby, it's all over. And um, that didn't sit really well with Teddy, so going back for that vote was great. But being able to go back to the Senate, going back to his office, was a very big thing for him. And so in uh, November of that year, he went back. You can see leashes. We have two dogs with us. You've never seen reporters look so happy to see uh, a senator or a senator so happy to be caught by a gaggle of reporters. I... And um, here's just a very short clip of them asking him a question and him answering, just so that you get a sense as to where he was. So this is November. He had been diagnosed in, in, in May. Working with Barack Obama on uh, health care, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, working with uh, all the administration on our uh, agenda. So we're very good, thankful for all the, the uh, good thoughts and prayers that we've received over the, uh, the time. Uh, we're looking for this, uh, forward to this uh, session, and uh, we're uh, delighted to be back. And he was so delighted to be back. The next big goal that he had was to receive um, an honorary degree from Harvard, which he did in a special convocation at the very beginning of December right after Thanksgiving. In the interim, he actually went to the Harvard-Yale game when it was 20 degrees. He decided at the last minute he wanted to do it. He was an old Harvard football player uh, like Dr. Berger, and he was just ecstatic about that. He, I, he didn't feel the cold at all. He was so thrilled to be with his old pals there. But he um, received an honorary degree, uh, and he there he is making that speech. His speech was so well received, and then he didn't want to leave the stadium, the, 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 leave the podium, and, and he just wanted to just, everybody was just cheering, and he was like, this is like the greatest thing. He just clearly loved a crowd. The guy was an absolute, complete ham. We left there and went 
to Florida for warmth. We were very blessed to be able to do that. Had his boat taken down to Florida so that he could sail, but he really went through a lot of physical rehab down there where it was warm weather. Back up in Massachusetts, it was far too cold. Washington was too cold. And he needed the warm weather to be able to get his strength and to, and, and to uh, be, get in training for the inauguration, which was his next big goal. He knew how many steps it took for him to walk. He had somebody in his office map it out. He knew how many steps there were for him to walk into the Capitol on his own motor power, walk into the Capitol, go in, go up to that podium to watch his president, Barack Obama, inaugurated. That was the goal he had. It's what he wanted to do, and he was able to do it. But in the interim, as we were in Florida, he decided that what he wanted, what the ultimate expression of hope and how he was feeling, was he wanted a new puppy. And that dog is named Captain's Courageous. His name is Cappy, and that dog is the joy of my life. He is the, a big palooka, that's all I can say. He is unbelievable. But I, there I had, as a caretaker for my husband and a new puppy, plus two other dogs at the same time. Yes, I am a wonderful woman. <laughs> No, I love that dog. And you can see Teddy was in his, um, his Ernest Hemingway phase at this point. He was growing his beard. He was just so, so happy about that. And then there was the inauguration. This is Inauguration Day. And, you know, we ended up hearing a lot about his having a seizure at the end of that day, but that's just something that happens, and it really was not a big deal. It was the, I mean, it was a big deal, but it was the end of the day. The joy had happened earlier in the day where he was there. He was at the lunch. He was out on this freezing day out there. But look at this. Does he look like a happy man standing out there, you know, as the, just before the president was being sworn in? In Florida, we had a, I had a special birthday party for him. We sang. He loved Broadway show tunes more than anything in the world. So I had a, a friends come, and I had somebody you may recognize. She's in a TV show. You may not know that she. Well, you may know because she was in a, some TV shows, also uh, movies where she sang. But she also is a Broadway singer. Um, but um, uh, Christine Baranski is a great was, is a great pal, and she came and sang. We sang Broadway show tunes out on our patio, and he was just ter really happy. And that was his that was his birthday. He then um, his actual birthday when he turned seventy seven. He um, he then. Oh, and I want to make sure I don't lose the other. Oh, yes, that's right. So then the next big step was the president was having at the White House a health care summit. Now, we're into March. He was diagnosed the preceding May. I think that you see how great he looks is really powerful, and that's why I wanted to give you my show and tell. He went, this is that day of the, of the health care summit at the White House at the beginning of March this was the cover of one of the weekly magazines. The president was supposed to call on Teddy to go to a podium where he had his prepared remarks and instead just called on him, and Teddy decided he wasn't going to speak from prepared remarks. He was, I mean, the president had called on him, and all of his colleagues were there. All of his colleagues I join with uh, all of those that feel that this is the uh, time, now is the time, uh, for action. I think most of us who have been in this uh, room before have uh, seen other times uh, when uh, the House and the Senate have made uh, efforts, but they haven't been the kind of serious effort uh, that I think uh, that we're seeing uh, right now. He went uh, now. on to say, which this clip, which he I was able to, to get from AP, cut off, and I wanted to, uh, which is the real part I wanted to show, the end of that clip, he says, I look forward to being a foot soldier in this battle, and this time we will not fail. And it was such a powerful moment and such a real shot in the arm for people who were fighting for health care reform. Shortly after that, there was a big birthday party for him given by the Kennedy Center in Washington. And there were, again, you can, again the Broadway show tunes, uh, big theme. There were Broadway stars and others. James Taylor was there. And at the end of it, there were special people singing happy birthday, um, and including the president, showed up to sing happy birthday to him. And I just show this because it was kind of cool. A few weeks ago, cool. but he got a star-studded tribute last night at the Kennedy Center in Washington. Even the president got into the act. It's 
pretty wonderful. Kennedy is being treated for brain cancer. He was all smiles last night. It's 10 months after his diagnosis. It's and 10 months. He's there just holding court. Afterwards, he just, he saw every single person. He sat on a chair and people came up and just to tell him how happy they were to be there. And he never again wanted to leave. I'm telling you, the man did love a crowd. And it was, it was hot and he just was, he just wanted to see people. And it was just such a joyous moment. He then had the great honor of being asked to throw out the first pitch at opening day for the Boston Red Sox. Now, you talk about a kid. Uh, he was so thrilled. But because of his disease, it was not, and, and, and because of terrible shoulder calcification from those football days, he, throwing was not something that, the combination of right side throwing and bad shouldering was not something that was really going to go very well. And we knew that, but that was fine. He was throwing to Jim Rice, the, hall of, the new Hall of Famer, and he was told, you won't be on the pitcher's mound. And Teddy practiced, practiced, practiced. He had it really down. He knew it was going to be great. He was a very, a theme here as a preparer. He was a big preparer. And he goes out there. The crowd is with him. Roar, he's all excited. And they put him on the pitcher's mound. Well, the angle of throw was down, and that was not so good. And so it took a little hop. Not good. For opening day and a hop was not good. He was not happy about that. So he turned to Terry Francona and he said, I want one more. Now, who does that, right? <laughs> and so Francona does like this. He says, one more. And later that night, later that night, so this, oh, that's more Kennedy Center. But la there's Teddy on the mound. How great is that picture? Do you think there's a man enjoying himself? Later that night, Teddy told our grandsons, he said, I was going to stay out there all day until Jim Rice caught it without a hop. He said, that's what we Kennedys do. We stay at it until we get it right. <laughs> it was a great lesson of life. The, his last public appearance in Washington was for um, the signing of the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act, and it was this great bipartisan bill where it was overwhelmingly bipartisan in passage, Republicans and Democrats. And the last act, Orrin Hatch moved for by acclamation that the Serve America Act be named the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act, and we were at the Senate actually the day it passed, and it was wonderful, expanding um, national service. So we went to the White House um, before... And this is the president walking Teddy out of the Oval Office on the way to a school in Washington where they signed it. And the back story here is that the, Teddy's car was not at the front of the line, and the president himself went to the Secret Service. He had run out himself, not staff, to tell the Secret Service, get Kennedy's car up there first. And the president was so kind and tender to him. It was really lovely. Um, and here's Teddy introducing the president. Um, and the president was just enjo enjoying the moment and um, giving Teddy the pen. Teddy, proud to have that pen. And it was his, um, it was just a real, real moment. We went, then we went on to the Cape, but he continued to work by teleconference with his committee, continued to have staff people coming to the house, and Chris Dodd was his, uh, his lieutenant who was chairing his committee on health care. The very first committee in the history of the country to pass comprehensive health care reform was his Health and Human Resources Committee in July 2009. And this is a picture the day that they passed. Teddy's not there, but we watched it, and we, he talked to them that day on the telephone. And he, we watched it on streaming video. Um, he never could get over the fact that you could see those things on live on that machine. I had it on wireless with no and no plug in. He was just totally mesmerized by that. Um, but it was it was what he called the cause of his life, and he was able to see it pass out of his committee, which was such an exhilarating thing. And here we are, two weeks before we lost him. He was still headed out to sail. We had this great um, golf cart, um, and there's. Our oldest dog, Splash, we just lost uh, just before Christmas this last year. Um, but he's headed out, which he continued to do for a very long time. 
One of the things, and I'm coming here to the end, that he was able to do that he was so proud of, and Jan showed you the cover of that book, was to complete his memoir. He, he was so organized, as I said, and he had time set aside every day. He had kept a diary for 50 years, for 50 years. Actually, longer, I have his diary from his first communion that he dictated to his nanny. Of course, he made his first communion with the Pope, so it was something that was worth <laughs> dictating. Um, it was, I know, really. Um, but I, I, he, he was a note, he was a, he kept notes, and he dictated all the time, every important thing that happened in his life, which was a real lesson. So we had this rich wealth of information, and it also prompted his memory on other stories, and it was just, it was fantastic. And he had done a five-year oral history project, an official oral history project that uh, he was just completing just before his illness. So there was a lot of wonderful information in there. But during this, the last 15 months, he was able to have such good quality time with the family. And one of the stories that was his favorite, that in, for our family, one of the things we cherish the most, and why I think it's so important for the continued work that you do here and uh, for continued research so that we can have these quality moments with family and we can continue to make this pro progress is the story you're going to hear here because he did have this time with our family. He got to hear, he got to experience this. And this is a little promotional video he did uh, when we were in Florida for the book because he had written this portion of the book. <laughs> One of my favorite stories uh, involved uh, what uh, I call Little Teddy, this Big Teddy, which that's myself, and then Medium Teddy, and then Little Teddy, Little Teddy. In the very beginning, he didn't get much satisfaction, didn't like sailing. He had to bail out his boat, and he was always in trouble, and he didn't want to continue uh, sailing. But as uh, we took more and more time to go over uh, the uh, uh, technique and the various uh, kind of uh, procedures on that uh, on those boats, uh, little Teddy just got better and better and better. The start of uh, August, middle of August, uh, he began to win the races. And at the last uh, race, uh, he won uh, the whole series. Uh, and by the end of the summer, he was eager to learn. When they gave the awards, uh, he got the award for the most improved sailor. Uh, I think they're and, related. Uh, that was a great... Uh, a great moment. You, you couldn't even button up his uh, coat because his chest was so filled uh, with uh, pride and, and uh, achievement on that. And it was a great lesson, whether you were uh, a child or whether you're a grown-up, that the uh, longer I live, uh, the fact is, uh, by persevering and sticking at it and working at it, uh, you have a real opportunity to have an impact. And I think I'll let Teddy have the last word on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I've been asked to come up and deliver a brief um, overview of my story. Um, I'm 31 years old, born and raised in Spokane, Washington. Um, at approximately the age of seven, I began having headaches that were so severe that I would lose my footing, fall to the floor, and not be able to rise until the headache relieved. Um, most headaches were so severe that they would reach a point that I was continually vomiting um, until I fall asleep on the bathroom floor. Um, this went on for a period of time, progressing from a couple times a month to several times per week. Uh, I was taken in for various types of consultations, uh, including my pediatrician, uh, orthopedist, rheumatologist, and neurologist, all of which offer diagnoses that were all but correct. For example, my parents were told that I had environmental allergies, allergies to food, Pineapple, particularly, because that was my favorite food. Um, spinal disease. Um, the headaches would typically come on during the day when I was at play at recess at school. At one point, a neurologist told my parents that I was possibly not getting along with the children at school. 
and that's why I would come home from school. Um, finally, in October of 1989, I started to lose my eyesight, uh, literally blind for periods of time. It was an ophthalmologist uh, that noticed an abnormality when he examined my pupils, compression or pressure of the optic nerve. Uh, I was sent that evening for, to the hospital for my very first CT scan. The neurosurgeon in Spokane informed my parents that I had a large softball-sized brain tumor occupying a large portion of the right hemisphere of my brain. The prognosis was not optimistic. The tumor was one that he felt could not be completely removed and that I would certainly uh, emerge from surgery um, with permanent, severe, debilitating neurological deficits. After receiving this diagnosis, my mother consulted her employer, a rheumatologist, who immediately began searching for a second opinion. He had recently read a medical journal-typed article uh, regarding this um, up-and-coming physician um, who was breaking the mold in terms of neurosurgery uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle. This doctor had recently developed a new dramatically promising procedure called brain mapping. My mother's employer asked my parents' permission to make the call to University of Washington. Dr. Berger immediately responded with a request for my MRI CT scans. When the response arrived, it was almost unbelievable. Dr. Berger felt that he could not only operate safely, but was optimistic that my tumor was overall very treatable. He wanted us to get in the car and report to Seattle ASAP. My parents canceled the surgery that was scheduled for the following morning, got in the car, and never looked back. I arrived and underwent multiple testing, including a WADA test, which identifies dominance in neural hemispheres. I was left-handed. My tumor was on the right side. So there was initial hesitation. However, Dr. Berger was able to identify that, miraculously, I was left brain dominant. Uh, Thanksgiving night, I checked into the children's hospital and three days later, uh, underwent a 13-hour surgery. When I awoke, I was informed that Dr. Berger was able to resect all but a small portion of my brain tumor. It was a pleomorphic xanthroastrocytoma, which is a common benign pediatric occurrence. Dr. Berger recommended that I continue MRI monitoring of this portion of the tumor, but I was sent home to resume childhood, which I did. In 1991, my MRI revealed that the small portion of brain tumor had indeed progressed. I returned to Seattle and had my second brain surgery. This time, he was able to resect the entire tumor. However, with the advancement of technology and pathology identification, this time he felt my tumor was better described as an astroblastoma, which is also a benign brain tumor. Although he had resected the entire tumor, he felt it would be important for me to have a course of radiation therapy following surgery and continue with MRIs. So for three months, my family and I lived in the Ronald McDonald House in Seattle, Washington, where I underwent my therapy and several follow-up tests. I made many lifelong friends with my cancer, pediatric cancer siblings um, that I still have to this day. After radiation was complete, I was a little upset about my hair and my skull, as Dr. Berger mentioned. And so he offered to send me to a very prominent salon in Seattle for a day of beauty. Um, I spent the entire day with several hair specialists montaging palatable hairstyles until I left feeling absolutely beautiful. I will never forget that day. I returned home after that and tried to resume normal life, which I did, went back to school, continuing having my MRI follow-up scans. In 1995, however, a spot showed up on an MRI scan, and Dr. Berger had, again, advanced technology at his fingertips and requested me to come back to Seattle. And so I did, and I received stereotac stereotactic radiotherapy, um, which did completely dissolve the lesion that was seen on, on the MRI scan, um, and it was great because I was done in one day. It was very different than the surgical experience I had had from before. 
1998, I graduated high school with no missed grades and no academic delay. I went, um, went on to um, live a very normal teenage life, um, started driving, and life was good for a long time. 2001, my MRI revealed another lesion. Dr. Berger this time called me back for my first trip, or called me back to have surgery for my first trip to San Francisco, where I received my third brain surgery, this time a meningioma, also a benign tumor that he felt was likely the cause of radiation exposure from years prior. I went home after surgery, this time with a mission. I was going to work with a doctor that I so respected and loved. And I then went to nursing school. In 2007, I graduated from the Hawaii Pacific University nursing program, called my favorite doctor, and said, it's my turn to pick your brain. <laughs> I said, please put in a good word for me because I'm applying at the neurological unit at UCSF. And he did. In October, on October 8th, 2007, I began my journey as a neurological nurse, helping those like myself. At this point, I again found home with the population that I so loved and identified with. In February of 2010, after giving birth to my first child, Charlie Mitchell, my MRI donned another tumor. I underwent my fourth and hopefully final surgery. The surgery revealed that my original tumor had once again resurfaced. A full resection was achieved, and I returned to work in May. I have been fortunate enough never to have my tumor progress to a metastatic form, nor have I ever suffered from a seizure or neurological deficit. Through it all, even as a child, through all my therapy and all my consultations with Dr. Berger, he has always gotten down on my level and said to me, are you with me? Let's get rid of this thing. I'll never forget that because he's the only one that ever did. Everyone else spoke to my parents and over me. He made sure we were a team. I vow the rest of my life and career will be dedicated to this population that have my heart and the man who made it all possible. Dr. Berger, we have one common goal, to find a cure for this horrible disease and help those who suffer with this disease live more, a more contented life through love and a certain normalcy while battling for survival. Every day counts and should be considered a gift. Thank you for having me. Uh, boy, I have to say, Stacy, this is a hard act to follow. Um, I'm going to just talk very briefly a little bit about what I do. Um, so I am Jenny Clark. I'm one of the four adult neuro-oncology physicians at the UCSF Brain Tumor Center. And I spend a lot of my time seeing patients, a number of whom are sitting in the audience today. A lot of them are being treated on clinical trials, but many more are either being treated outside of a trial or have completed treatment and are in follow-up and coming back to check in. I often work in tandem with local medical and radiation oncologists to care for patients who live farther away, providing expertise, interpreting MRI scans, and helping to guide treatment. Most of the rest of my time is spent either teaching, trying to develop those young physicians who are going to take on the leadership elsewhere that Dr. Desmond Hellman talked about, or doing clinical research, in particular writing clinical trials, getting them up and running, monitoring and reporting toxicities, and analyzing the treatment results. Although I don't do laboratory research myself, I also work closely with our lab researchers to identify promising new treatments and combinations of treatments, and then to move them forward into the clinic by testing them in clinical trials. It probably won't come as a surprise to you if I tell you that physicians are goal-oriented, both by nature and by training. Our goal here at the Brain Tumor Center is to cure brain tumors, and that this is important really goes without saying. But of equal importance is the journey that our patients and their loved ones take to get there, and that journey is the focus of the discussion today. I've always understood that this is a difficult journey, and I've understood that both intellectually and emotionally. Last winter, however, my husband's father was diagnosed with a glioblastoma, and I found myself in the position that many of you are in, of having a loved one with a brain tumor. I also found myself in the role of guide and translator for my family. A small part of that involved discussing the treatment options, 
but a much larger part involved explaining what effect this diagnosis and treatment was going to have on their lives, addressing side effects of both the tumor and the treatment, negotiating and arranging for physical, occupational, and speech therapy, and wading through a morass of health insurance and disability forms. It was an incredible challenge, even with an insider like myself to help, and it really brought home to me how overwhelming this experience must be for families that don't happen to already have a neuro-oncologist in the family. The current model for clinical practice appropriately focuses on evaluation of the patient themselves, but it allows for little input from the caregivers. We hope to modify this, partnering with our caregivers to better understand the daily challenges that the patient and their caregivers may be experiencing. Our goal is not only to improve the caregiver experience, but also to improve quality of life for the patient. We have a proposal for a new integrated clinical practice model that we're very excited about. We would like to add a team centered around a nurse specialist whose area of expertise would be quality of life in neuro-oncology. Many of our patients have their MRI scans at UCSF just before they come in to see the doctor. That takes about 45 minutes. What we'd like to do is we'd like to start by asking our patients to identify their primary caregiver and then to give us permission for that nurse to meet with the caregiver during those 45 minutes to assess potential issues across the physical, cognitive, emotional, and social domains, as well as to identify caregiver needs and concerns. He or she could then tailor the recommendations, including potential referrals to social work, physical, occupational, or speech therapy, neuropsychology for cognitive evaluation or emotional support, or to a nutritionist. I'm really excited about this practice model, which I think is gonna bring us an important step closer to providing the truly interdisciplinary care that we strive for at the Brain Tumor Center. And we're currently working to raise money to implement this concept. Equally exciting is the fact that, in addition to providing this additional support for patients and their caregivers, this model will allow us to collect important information about quality of life that can be evaluated in our research setting, providing us with valuable data that we can in turn use to further improve care down the road and allow us to make that journey we're all on a little bit easier. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Um, my talk today is a little bit about what we as nurses do. Um, and I wanted to start about the goals um, of nursing in general. And uh, of course, our first goal as nurses is to um, administer and or coordinate the care that the doctor directs us to do. But in addition, we work to promote patient safety. We work to assist patients and families with coping with changes um, and in their health status. And lastly, we work to optimize patients and families' quality of life. And that's really what I want to talk to you about what we do today. And so how do we do that as nurses, particularly um, when we're thinking about the brain, tumor, the brain tumor patient population? So the first thing we do is we act as educators. As you all know, um, when a patient's diagnosed, the need for information is enormous. Um, when patients and families are called to learn about the disease and the treatments. And basically, these patients and their families have landed in a place that they didn't ask to be, um, and to get along, they have to learn a whole new subject area. And if you think about that subject area, it's not an easy one. They have to learn neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, and pharmacology, all in the same time sort of managing many, many appointments with healthcare providers. The other tricky part is that often the patient is still recovering from surgery, um, and so this burden often falls on the caregiver. And so it's up to the caregiver to learn this new vocabulary, and how to navigate and sometimes wrestle with the healthcare system to get what it is that they need for their, for their loved one. Um, in addition, they're having to continue working, run the house, manage the finances. So as you can imagine, this is really a busy and stressful time. So as nurses, um, I feel like it's a, an honor to be able to be there to help patients and their caregivers navigate through the healthcare system, sort of reinforce what they've learned from the doctors, um, be available to answer any questions, and sort of assist as they go along. One of the other things that nurses do um, in conjunction with the healthcare team is manage symptoms. And if we can manage some of the patient's symptoms, that can have a definite positive impact on quality of life. So at the same time that the patient and the family is trying to learn all this new information, 
they're sort of grappling with the ramifications of the side effects or the symptoms of the disease and the side effects of the treatment. So a lot of patients have changes in their physical capabilities. They might not move as well. They might not see as well. So their safety is impaired. Their mobility is impaired. And a lot of them have real diminished energy as well. Um, they may suffer from changes in their cognitive capacities, meaning their memory might not be as good and their processing is not as good. And we also see changes sometimes in personality and mood, which is not always due to the tumor itself, but sometimes the medications. And so what we, what we try to do with the doctors is think about how we can make these things better. Um, so we might suggest changes in medications if that's appropriate. We might need to modify treatment regimens. And then we sort of call on all of the ancillary services and resources that we know. So we make referrals for patients to physical therapy, to speech therapy, occupational therapy. Um, as far as the cognitive changes, we try to get, um, make referrals to neuropsychiatrists and neuropsychologists so they can evaluate the cognitive changes that patients have undergone. They might provide counseling. Um, as you know, this is sort of a life-threatening, life-altering event. Um, and so th there's a lot to deal with at that time. We also would focus on integration, or we do focus on integration of some of the complementary therapies, thinking about um, complementary medicine, nutrition, yoga, acupuncture. We want to really pull together that mind, body, spirit sort of focus um, on improving one's health. The key is that we need to remember that the patient needs care, but so does the caregiver. Um, we need to make sure uh, that the caregiver has resources to make sure that the patient's needs are met, um, that they have access to counseling. They too are, this is a life-altering event for them. Um, their life is different the day that diagnosis comes. As Vicki said, it becomes our brain tumor. We can make referrals to social work to help with the financial things and also provide respite care if necessary or make referrals for respite care. I think anybody who's experienced with neuro-oncology realizes that the changes that patients and families undergo are chronic. Um, that patients and families continue to suffer ongoing losses and that their needs continue and change even sometimes in spite of stable disease. So they have, yes, physical changes, cognitive changes, and emotional changes. But there's also changes going on in people's social lives, their social status may have changed, as well as their financial status. So that is really why I'm excited um, to be here today and part of this talk. Um, and I'm excited about what's happening here at UCSF. Not only do we have like amazing things happening on the bench, uh, we have the top neurosurgeons in the country, we have access to cutting edge therapies, but the UCSF Brain Tumor Program, as Jenny talked about, um, is about to launch a for or formalize a program for patients and caregivers that's dedicated uh, to supporting quality of life issues um, and helping assist patients deal with those. Um, we're going to have a team that's committed um, and available to optimize um, care surrounding quality of life issues. And so they'll be, they'll be doing what, what I talk about that I do now, but they're going to have the time and the resources to really make a big impact. So they're going to do even better. Uh, they'll be focusing on education, assisting with navigation, providing care ancillary uh, referrals to ancillary services, and again, with a big focus on caregivers. Because we know um, if we can help take care of the caregiver, then they can take care of the patient, which then improves the patient's quality of life, which then circularly improves the caregiver's quality of life. Um, so it can only be a good thing. It's a, good, it's a big circle. So I'm really excited about this, um, and I think it's really going to set UCSF above the rest. It's going to give us a little... Um, set us apart, and more importantly, though, I think it's going to have nothing but a positive impact on the difficult journey that our patients and families face each day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, question for Mrs. Kennedy. Um, several questions uh, people want to know about the decision you both made about the quality of life and the quality of time, the time you had left. Did you have this aha moment? What did you say to each other? People want to know about the quality of time you guys decided to have. Um, I, I think the picture sort of said it all. There was never a question that we were going to live life. Uh, and there was not an aha moment because it was all Teddy. He was, uh, it, it was his, it, it's just who he was. He was a fighter. He was a...
it doesn't mean fighter is maybe the wrong word. It was just in his being to keep going. It's how he had gotten through situations in his life. He had faced difficult moments in his life and the way he always did it was to just keep going. And he was determined to keep going and to keep living life. And he understood that he, that people were looking to him and he wanted to be a positive example for our family, for our children, for our grandchildren, that even when you're faced with something as this, as difficult as this diagnosis, that you can keep going. And he felt he had an obligation to, to people in general and that maybe something good could come from his diagnosis. And I actually think something good has come from his diagnosis. I think I didn't know what a glioblastoma was. It was, it, I had never heard the term, to be honest, and I think I'm a pretty uh, savvy, educated person. And I think a lot of people didn't, had, didn't know what it was. And now we, it's something people talk about. Here we are talking this morning. Uh, it, obviously, everyone here's life is, aff is affected by it, but it's something that's much more in the news and research, and it's out there. And I think that raising uh, awareness and shining a, a light on it is something that would make Teddy very happy. Thank you. Question for Stacy. We hear your story, and you are a four-time survivor, shall we say, and a mom. So what gives you the spirit to say, I can beat this? Stacy? It's not really a matter of having spirit to beat this. You just, like Vicki said, you do what you have to do. You're alive. You're not dead. And, um, you know, until it brings you to your knees, you really keep going. Well, you're a great inspiration. Thank you. Uh, several questions here, Dr. Berger, on a vaccine for brain tumor on stem cell transplants. Can you address those? Well, maybe I could talk a little bit about stem cells, and then, Jenny, you can address the vaccine. Margareta, you've worked with the vaccine. You know, we're all cautiously optimistic about stem cells. Um, we're very excited about it for a number of reasons. But I think that we're, we're at that phase now where we're just trying to learn. We're trying to understand. And... The reality is that we think that the stem cell is going to be very, very important for a couple different reasons. Number one, we can take a stem cell and we can modify it and we can give it back to animals and the stem cell will actually track to a tumor. So we've been given a $20 million grant by the state of California. You as taxpayers voted for it. And here it is, back to us. And in four years, what we have been asked to develop is a stem cell loaded with a therapeutic gene that we can give to a patient in the tumor that will deliver the gene and transfect the tumor. So we're at the end of the first year of that project. It's going very well. We're about ready to start the next phase. So we have great hope for it. The other quick point is that we believe that stem cells are going to help us understand the field of plasticity, neuroplasticity, um, and being able to reprogram your brain after it's been injured to improve function. So this is something that we're hoping is going to be elucidated in the future, and it's something we're very proud of. Quick comment from Dr. Clark, perhaps? Sure. So just cancer vaccines are an area that have been in the news a lot. And the idea behind a vaccine, much like the more traditional ones that you've taken for all the, you know, measles and mumps and all the infectious diseases, the idea is that a vaccine will alert your immune system to the fact that there is something that shouldn't be there and then get the immune system revved up to fight off your own tumor. And it's a different idea than the chemotherapy and the radiation, which are kind of foreign outside toxins trying to fight from externally. And the hope is that we can really come up with a complementary method that will work in tandem with those to allow your body to do some of the fighting for us. And Teddy was diagnosed in 2008. And you see the progress that was made as much as we hear bleak stories so often, but you think of quality of life and extension of life in that period of time. And I think that what you're doing here 
and what's happening around the country, and we all have to be out there being advocates for continued research at NIH. And I'm really, I don't mean to sound overtly political and say go lobby, but I really go lobby, fight for it. <laughs> Let your voices be heard because it is so important. This is a, we, we all need to be participating as individuals but this, we need our government. You're so blessed here to have the state of California behind, behind this kind of stem cell research, but we also need our federal government to be behind uh, our research in every way. This is bigger than us. You know, Teddy, my favorite, my favorite quote of my husband is, we are Americans. This is what we do. We reach the moon. We scale the heights. I know it. I've seen it. I've lived it and we can do it again. And we are Americans. We have done the most incredible things as Americans. We have done the breakthrough things in medicine, whether it's finding the polio vaccine, artificial heart, and on and on and on. When it comes to this issue of cancer and brain cancer, brain tumors in particular, I really, really believe we as Americans can do it again. Thank you very much. So, Vicki Kennedy, Dr. Mitch Berger, Stacey Sullivan, Dr. Clark, Margaret Page. How about a wonderful thank you to all of them.